well <laughs> i'm already excited <laughs> this i'm not gonna my first impression is that there's fraud <laughs> <laughs> but i want to hear it I, <laughs> so actually I, I have a little side story to add here that I think is going to go pretty well. So uh, as my two hosts know, I just got a brand new computer. Um, I literally set it up yesterday. And I the first thing I did was downloaded the Brave browser because I obviously am not interested in Microsoft Edge. I did use Chrome and uh, Firefox for a while, but uh, Brent has fully convinced me that Brave is the way to go. So yesterday, So I did download and install Brave and I realized that I didn't really have a way to log in to my computer from or to my old um, Brave login. And I couldn't figure it out. So I basically ended up going to our website using our Brave login and getting a new Brave download. And obviously my thought wasn't, oh, let me see how much I can game the system. But there is kind of like I expected there to be a way for me to to marry all of my Brave accounts and just have one that I would use on my uh, now my laptop and my desktop. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. I I obviously it's most likely this guy was being fraudulent, and I'm totally cool with them. You know, deleting and you know confiscating accounts that are blatantly fraudulent. Um, but I could see this coming up more and more often, especially when there is a little incentive installed somewhere where people can have that filter where they have to decide, well, am I going to go left or right here? Um, Yeah, as a quick side note, I'm not saying that this would be, um, this isn't like evidence or anything. It's just a first impression thing. In the title, 
He says, I got tipped hundreds of dollars via Brave. I was really happy. And then they decided to keep the money and accuse me of fraud. So, you know, we've had stories like, for example, Brent, you had a story about how you got uh, banned from Coinbase and we've been in the space for a while. So you see stories all the time of somebody who's being punished unfairly. Usually they want to lead out with the explanation of where the misunderstanding is, right? So like if you had made a post about your experience with Coinbase, you would have been like, I logged in from Cuba and they suspended my account, right? Or like you would kind of give an explanation of what happened and why it's being misinterpreted. Instead, what they're doing here is he's just saying like, oh, I made money. And then they randomly decided to accuse me of fraud and then doesn't reference it at all, which makes me like, I don't know. I feel like if you really felt it was unjust, you would have led with that. Yeah, we, we talk about signaling theory a lot. You know, when there's an easy explanation and you take a rather difficult explanation, maybe there's a reason for that. Right. <laughs> yeah why Least would surprising anybody care thing. about the document in which they state why they're taking the money why would that be relevant to this discussion <laughs> oh man all right well maybe he provides the evidence Wow, what a show. <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. <laughs> All right. Jim Breyer. Oh, is that <laughs> That's that? super interesting. I have no idea. But that that is Jim Breyer. He is a billionaire investor, and uh, he wanted to be on... The record for saying, one second, please. Do, 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 do. The future is bright for cryptocurrency. So, you know, I, I saw this title. I had a, a lot of upvotes. Um, I wanted to find some positive news. So that's what I did. So I learned a little bit about this guy. He has some uh, significant stakes in some large companies, including Dell. Blackstone and Walmart, and he's referring to this as the nuclear winter and, you know, doesn't go into a lot of details about what that is or what that is defined as, but I'm pretty sure we can put our own definitions on that and feel just comfortable about it. He says he is still very high on crypto despite the price dumps. Um, he says that it reminds us that um, he basically points out, and I like the way that he worded this basically you know he talked about some other bubbles that have happened in technology but he decided to lump in the internet bubbles with the artificial intelligence industries from the 90s and i and i'm kind of curious like the concept of artificial intelligence to me didn't start kind of reaching public form until you know much after the 90s in my opinion but at the end of the day all of it is artificial intelligence so it is kind of lumped together and um he's on he's quoted to saying these cycles keep happening every decade or so and this type of seasonality is inevitable um and the final thing that the the article noted was that he says so many of the very best computer scientists and deep learning PhD students and postdocs are working on blockchain because they have so much fundamental interest in what blockchain can mean. Finishes it with, you don't want to bet against the best and brightest in the world. Honestly, I thought that was a pretty interesting take. And essentially, like whatever the markets are doing right now are largely irrelevant because 
the main thing that I took from this is that technology is ever evolving and the young people are always going to be our, uh, our our boat our connection from you know a new style or an old style to a new style and yeah like once these students you know have access to blockchain from their high school years through their you know upper graduate years yeah this is a whole different scenario when we're teaching you know young people all over the world like what this really is going to do yeah. And, and like it's, it just signals that there's a lot of interest in that direction and you're going to get a lot of talent that's going to be drawn in that direction. And we still, I mean, the exciting part is when the innovation starts to come in, that actually starts affecting people's lives. So, uh, what, this is the position we've had on the show for a while, right? Of course, uh, the price is brutal, but it was overhyped. Uh, and that's what does end up happening with technology. So he's right about those cycles. Uh, people get too excited about it. You know, we're seeing something similar to like even 3D printing. <clears throat> I remember a long, long, long time ago, Brent would call. He he, he told me, oh, you're going to see this huge spike in 3D printing stocks. And then there was. And then there was a big fail because they were just kind of excited ahead of time. And now it's climbing rapidly back up because it's still an emerging technology that's still going to dominate a ton of industries. You know, so it's it is cyclical. So I went into the comments and found an interesting little thread here that I'm going to include. <clears throat> the first comment just kind of made me laugh. Uh, and Kavokios with a bunch of numbers says, I also want to be rich so people listen to me. He's right in a lot of ways. Like anybody with influence just has the ability to like get recognition, right? And, you know, if somebody's rich, they we the general public that considers themselves not rich overvalues the opinion of somebody that is financially more successful than them. For sure. Um, Bro, oh. if you're if you're really, really rich, you could be an absolute moron and people will think you're so smart they'll even vote for you for being president. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically. Hypothetically. <laughs> that is it. How did you know I was talking about John? Wait, McAfee? wait, guys. Have you actually watched the Netflix McAfee documentary yet? I have not. I, I watched it recently. It it delivered, man. More than I could have expected. Is it he he seems like legitimately insane. Like legit. I don't know if I don't wanna I don't wanna influence your opinion. <sighs> okay, I gotta watch this thing. Um, there's a couple more comments down here, and I found this one a little interesting because this was a an excellent response. Basically, one of the comments was, this dude keeps promoting gold as the best safe haven asset and therefore has a company that sells gold. Um, you know, I have mixed opinions on this because anybody that is going to promote gold as the best safe haven asset probably is going to own a gold company, right? If somebody... Same way we own Bitcoin because we believe Bitcoin is the future and is really, you know, going to be something relevant someday. And, um, you know, but we have a crypto podcast, so we're biased. Like, it's interesting. Like, these biases are always going to exist. But I think it's important to try to filter out which ones are relevant to you, which ones actually matter and, you know, what you're going to let influence you. Yeah, and you, I think we're definitely seeing some overlap between some of the people that tend to be very pro gold, and then you still see some people. So, like for example, you have um, like Peter Schiff is like super pro gold, and he's very anti cryptocurrency. Uh, he owns a gold business, and sometimes you listen to him talk, and it does feel like there's a bias there that he's anti crypto because I think he sees it as something that eats into. Um, the gold market, but then you have people like uh, Mike Maloney or something that look at gold and they're like, yeah, Bitcoin is kind of a digital gold and it's a great way to mix them. So, you know, uh, yeah, there's biases, but sometimes those biases can align even in a case like this.
Yep. Agreed. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Brent. So this, I actually saw this and I'm glad that you covered this article, but the, the HTC Exodus one blockchain phone is being released. Uh, I kind of want to know what this is all about. I, I like some of the default features. What do you got for us? I use Firefox all the time too, for what it's worth. I still like them a lot. I, I think Brave is great, but like Firefox still is pretty good in my opinion. So I do use them. What what I what my experience has been is that the larger the website is, the easier it is for Brave to interact with it. And some of the smaller sites or smaller businesses, especially crypto related, uh, there's some very minor hiccups or inconveniences. So take that with what you will. Uh, I'm I'm probably gonna have to install a second browser on here just as a backup in case um, you know I'm in a time crunch and I need to make sure that I can access you know a browser in time. <laughs> yeah that's a super important uh thing no question <laughs> oh man all right so let's move back to traditional time and talk about one of my favorite countries, the kingdom of, just kidding, not the kingdom, just Japan. <laughs> uh, 
what? Okay, see, now that's... I would like to play bullish or bullshit with that. Head yeah, head. I call. Uh, so, but no, listen, it's not no, possible. Okay. It's not impossible. It's... It's probably a thing, but it's probably not practical for you to take advantage of it, despite how much you're going to try. And honestly, I hope you succeed. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, it's not right, like we all know you start how, airbnb it. <laughs> we all know how much Brent is really tied to America. Yeah, but Japan's expensive, Mike. He wants to go live like Thailand. Not if they spot you a house. Bro, that's so, hell yeah, still. Anyway, gentlemen, we are going to play bullish or bullshit with this headline. And the headline is Japan. Uh, Mike, don't be looking ahead. Don't be looking ahead in the outline. Well, I accident I accidentally covered this entire article oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, didn't yeah, realize true. you did it. <laughs> that's true. So that's probably not a good idea. All right. So the title is. <laughs> Japanese politician proposes relaxing crypto laws to boost adoption. Brent, your instincts are right on point, absolutely for every reason that you said. So let's go down. It was it was kind of an easy one, but all of your reasonings were on point. So you know how, like in math class, they want you to show your work. <laughs> I, I would give you full credit on this math question. Um, so yes, first of all, it's just a Japanese lawmaker. His name is Takeshi Fukimaki. Fujimaki, so it is a very Japanese name, and <laughs> and Brent, there is something important here. You're right; it is a politician in a system like ours, and he's part of the opposition party. So this guy is in the minority party specifically. So to give you a frame of reference, they have two chambers, just like we do, a House and a Senate, and they have 11 seats out of 242 in the senatorial chamber. So that's Four percent. So that would be like having four senators in our system. Uh, kind, kind of. It's actually so that's there's not an equal layer because for reference, we only have two independent senators. So we only have two people who aren't Republicans or Democrats. And this would be like having four. So it's obviously we have two uh, independent senators. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I've never heard that before. Yeah. No, he yeah, but Sanders is one of them, and I believe uh, Ang King is the other one. I think, hmm. um, and then the same thing in the House. It would be like if they had eleven members of Congress out of four sixty or like ten. So it's definitely a minority party. Maybe it's like saying the Libertarian or the Green Party, maybe slightly more powerful than that, but not much. So it doesn't mean a ton. Also, it's actually more of a right wing party because he's an ex banker turned politician, and he's his shtick is basically de deregulation. Uh, there's another article where he's talking about how the next uh, guy who has to run the Bank of Japan is going to be miserable because um, basically Japan has set itself up for failure, according to this guy. But going back to the actual headline, yes, he proposed very reasonable guidelines, actually. But of course, we're biased. But this is what he says. Number one, tax cryptocurrency gains at 20% instead of at 55%. That's the first one. So that would be close to what we do for capital gains here in the States, guys, where it would be 15%. Um, he also said, <laughs> he also says, have losses be able to count towards future profits. Wouldn't that be fantastic after this year? Yeah, I wish we could do that in poker. <laughs> Correct. Um no tax between token to token exchange. So if you go from Ethereum to Bitcoin, you shouldn't be taxed on that. I like that as well. And then this one seems kind of crazy to me. I don't think that this would ever fly, but he says 
make it so that any cryptocurrency payments are exempt from sales tax. So yeah, that one when I read it was just like, all right, I thought this was like pretty solid, but now it just seems way too idealistic. Yeah, I'm well. What government's gonna want to do that? What government's gonna say, okay, yes, if you put more faith in a different currency as opposed to our native currency, then we will reward you by eliminating one of our main sources of income. <laughs> I just don't really yeah. see uh, uh, <laughs> a government passing that law. So yeah, like you said, Brendan, it's you know. Yeah, agreed. The title was correct. Right, exactly. That's that's where if you don't go the extra step of saying, okay, is this a politician that actually has influence? Or is this, you know, it's a big difference if it's the leader of the house in control, right? Like, uh, whatever, Mitch McConnell here, different than... Uh, some independent senator absolutely so basically the story is independent guy has independent thoughts <laughs> yeah you could say that or minority party politician can say popular things that's another <laughs> possible title sounds good all right brent <clears throat> Yeah, I like this. I'm I'm curious where this conversation is going to go. What what are we talking about here? <laughs> well, hold on a second. You will die. You will die. I even if you don't, I hate to break it to you. You will die. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's obviously presenting itself in an extreme way. I don't agree with that. I, I would also, I would say that I understand what you're saying with the wealth transfer, but I think that also we should be talking about this as a possibility for, for wealth creation, you know, for innovation that is not necessarily just a transfer of wealth, but also, yeah, it is, it, it feels like a, generational investing opportunity, but that doesn't eliminate the fact that ultimately for any of us, regardless of where we are in our life period, 
you can make an argument that this is such a unique period because it's an emerging sector. So maybe invest more heavily in crypto right now because it's going to outperform traditional investments. Fair enough. But ultimately, all of us should strive to, as we approach retirement, have a balanced investment portfolio that distributes risks, that probably has stocks and bonds. So it really means that throughout your entire life, you're going to have to make an effort to educate yourself and make an effort to have a diverse investment portfolio. So no, I don't think we should look at this as our last opportunity to have a future <laughs> because it just creates an unnecessary dichotomy. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I, I'm significantly more a fan of the buy and hold, accumulate small investments here and there than I used to be. And this is the style that I'm more evolving into. However, there's going to be plenty of opportunities. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. This is probably a phenomenal opportunity. And I think that um, more than likely we were massively over where we should have been. And we're probably getting to the point where it's getting under where it could be. But obviously nobody knows. And, you know, at, at this point, I'm, you know, I went back and got a new job recently just for the purpose of, I think this is a rare opportunity. And I think that a long time from now, I, I may look at this season as, you know, when the US dollar crashed against Bitcoin for a while. And, you know, my buying power is going up because my life is a lot more US dollar oriented right now. And, and that's kind of the way that my life is looking at this because in, in 2030, I, I just believe that there's a chance that this could be so large that we have so much financial freedom as a result that that's worth it for me. And, you know, this could go down to a hundred for all I know. And we're going to talk about that in this, this next article, but that, that I'm going down with the ship and I, and I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very specifically the band on the Titanic still singing as it sinks. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> Michael so, Angelo. What's up? No, go ahead. Oh. Yeah. Hey, we just don't have a workflow right now. So I accidentally went and started researching an article that wasn't on uh, the Reddit or the subreddit. So I, I've been meaning to post more of my articles that I read off our cryptocurrency into the our cryptocurrency. So I ended up doing that. I found an article and I posted it for you guys to appreciate. Here's the link. I mean, I don't, I don't care about farming the karma, but uh, if you if you want to see more of these types of contributions in the future, this that would definitely be a good way to give me a tip or a positive reinforcement, as we discussed earlier. So Harvard economist says Bitcoin's future value more likely to be 100 than 100K. So off the top of your head, any thoughts on that? I was actually about to say what I like about this prediction is the fact that he didn't say zero or 100K because I would have called. 
I would have been like, no way. You know, Bitcoin will have minimum like a collector's value, minimum. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously though. Seriously, no, that's like, super interesting. You're you're a hundred percent right. It, um, but yeah, like, can it go to a hundred dollars? Like, can it not be something that people just throw a ton of money behind? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, yes, for the record, I, I totally agree. A hundred is more likely to happen, or I think a hundred is going to happen before a hundred k. And um, so I just kind of wanted to see what this is all about, where his logic was coming from, and what they had to say. So his name is uh, Kenneth Rogoff, and he is the professor of economics and public policy at Harvard. Um, he said that he believes the crypto. Still, or I'm sorry, he said that uh, most people think that crypto can explode to the 10, five to ten trillion dollar market cap range. Um, we've discussed that at times. He also says he concedes that 3,500 ish range is is no reason to panic sell. He's just accepting that this is part of what we can expect in these types of markets. Um, he then goes on to say that he does think it's more likely to be worth 100 than 100k. That's you know the the crux of this the crux of this article is listed there. Um, he says the limit to Bitcoin is it's limited to transactions, therefore making it very vulnerable to bubble-like attacks because of the ability to increase and decrease transition uh, transactions. But there's a lot of spam prevention on the network already. So I'm kind of curious um, a little more of his thoughts into that. He also says that <laughs> it's energy intensive verification process is vastly less efficient than systems with a cent a trusted central authority like a central bank in quote um yeah i'm just going to personally vastly disagree with that i i don't think it is i think it's bitcoin's energy sustainability is vastly blown out of proportion in my opinion and i thought it was a very reasonable concern early on but i think that over time you're seeing a lot of these um larger mining fields you know getting renewable energy and applying it that's just a natural um evolution of this space and i see that only continuing and getting stronger and more efficient um, you know, also the, the author mentioned that, you know, there's concerns about the tax invasion and criminal activities um, and saying governments could regulate and appropriate it, but they think that more like, or he thinks that more likely the governments are going to try to stomp out these privately constructed systems. And, you know, we believe that that would be the goal of these governments. We've talked about that quite a bit on the show, um, but that sounds a lot more simple than it really is right like aren't we kind of reliving a a limewire napster type of world like disruption into a big centralized system that is going to fight it tooth and nail on the way down but eventually what can they do about peer-to-peer -peer digital transfers it's like so hard to police i don't know this this seems really really strange from you know such an educated person <laughs> yeah and, you know i'll add um it's not really a plug but i will say that this is uh one of the things that we talked about we were in the conference in thailand and we kept listening to charles hoskinson talk about why cardano is putting so many resources into trying to get on the ground in africa and you would hear him talk to like whatever investors or coders or people that he was meeting and basically just kept shooting this message where he's like, look, in the States and in Europe and all these places, people are just going to keep using what's already convenient. They already have Venmo. They already have PayPal. They already have Cash App. They, like, they have everything, and they're not going to just out of principle start using crypto. Uh, but he viewed Africa as a true opportunity to like, yo, let's try this out, like big scale for real in a developing economy, you know? And uh, yeah, it will be interesting to see.
<laughs> hey yo. <clears throat> And then turns out they did a bunch of damage. Three people killed. <laughs> yeah, and <clears throat> there's another quote in here that I kind of wanted to say at the end that, you know, part of me likes and part of me really disagrees with. I'll, I'll let you guys form your own opinion. But it says, the right way to think about cryptocurrency coins is as a lottery ticket that pays off in a dystopian future where they're used in in rogue and failed states, or perhaps in countries where citizens have already lost all semblance of privacy. It is no coincidence that dysfunctional Venezuela is the first issuer of a state-backed cryptocurrency, the Petro. Well, there was no trust in their local currency. <clears throat> yeah, but you know, more to the more to the heart of what we're discussing, though, we have seen um, businesses in Venezuela do seem to be going towards Nano and Dash and and Bitcoin, uh, because even if the even as these markets think about it this way, this is which is really mind blowing because it makes you think about it in relation to the dollar as opposed to um but think about the fact that probably for a lot of people in Venezuela, if they've been holding crypto, they still have been deflating less than their native currency. So they're not suffering the crypto bloodbath as much as we are. You know At I mean? the end of the day, one Bitcoin is always gonna be one Bitcoin, right? Right. <laughs> wow okay hold on this is really advanced man i'm trying to find a pen one doge all right never mind too dry, too dry. Oh, get on me here I think max one a week's fine. It'll it'll get too repetitive. We do more than that. Think of like impractical jokesters meets uh, you know reading a reading a portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> meets uh, wait wait what's the what's the name of the guy Dave Ramsey? <laughs> <laughs> no, I Jim Cramer. No. No, Dave Ramsey is the um he talks about he debt and, and then stuff. people call him in and and he tells him to get out of debt. <laughs> he I'm pretty sure Dave Ramsey does a little bit of that. You call him and then he's like, oh, "Buy a yacht." And then he's like, "Well, how much do you make?" And then they're like, "$18,000." And then he just yells at them. <laughs> Any audience questions today? It's been a slow chat day too. I think it's gonna do it right there. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. All right. <clears throat> Sounds Let's good. do it, guys. Thanks for joining us. Thank God. Hey, we're we're here for the long term. 
speak on it. Uh, cancel. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Thanks, SGP. Have a good one.